Hey fellow SweetScript developers, Eric from Stoic Software here again. In this video, I will be performing a teardown of some code that was volunteered by a very brave member of the effective SweetScript mailing list. Um, a teardown is a common service that I provide to my clients. Uh, it is a detailed code review where I provide my suggestions and recommendations for improving the quality uh, readability and performance of a SweetScript customization. Uh, before we get started, if you would like to become a competent and confident SweetScript developer yourself, get started now with my uh, free email course on the best resources for learning SweetScript. You will find a link down at the top of the description. All right, let's get started. Okay, first we will take a quick look at what the code does, and then we will get into uh, my feedback uh, and suggestions for improving it. So we have a single file. Um, this is a sweetlet, and we quickly scan through what we can see is on a get request, we create a form and uh, add fields, and a submit button. So very simple. We are creating a UI for the user to fill out some fields and submit the form. On the post event, we read the data out of the request parameters. And we use that data to create uh, an instance of a custom record that we have. So we create it, we fill out all the fields, save the record, and write a very simple message back to the user that their package was created. Um, and so that's it, pretty straightforward sweetlet. Uh, render a form, let the user submit it, and use that data to create a custom record. Okay. So uh, let's get into the review portion. Um, the very first thing I notice is the uh, name of the file. My file names, I like to have a very consistent naming scheme for just about everything, as you'll hear throughout this video, but um, file names specifically, uh, I like to start them with an abbreviation for usually uh, my company name or the, the project, uh, something like that. Uh, which which we have here with the three X's, but then I also like to include the script type. So what type of script is this? And uh, what does it do? Uh, quick description of the action of what this script performs. So the first thing I might do is rename this file according to that uh, naming scheme. So what I'm gonna do instead is just make a brand new file. And I'll put that next to it. I'll put that on the right side where we can see, we'll see the script side by side. All right, so first I would make something, our abbreviation is XXX. I use the abbreviation SL for sweetlets. And then what does this do? This creates a package, a custom record. So I might call this something like creation.js and it's that simple I, to me the version the sweet script version does not need to be in the file name um, you'll get that very quickly from looking at the file and also the API version uh, JS doc tag okay so let's move this to the right and we will adapt that as we go through this so I like my file names to answer two questions, maybe three, depending. Uh, who built it? What type of script is it? And what does it do? Um, the next thing I notice is that up here in the header, there's no, there's nothing describing what this actually does. Um, so in order to understand what this script does, or, or, or just to get an idea of what it does, we have to scroll through all the way through uh, 200 lines, 250 lines of code 
and we have to kind of parse out all the code, you know, so we have to go one at a time, like, okay, we're creating form here. We're adding some fields, more fields, some select options. There's a submit button. Okay. Then we create the record and we read all the data, set all the values, save the record. Okay. So we had to scroll through the whole script uh, to figure out what it does and we shouldn't have to do that. Uh, so you'll see over here as part of my templates, in my templates, I have it built in so that I provide a module description here. So that's where I might start. Okay, and there might, so we provide a description so that the next person looking at this, or when I come back in six months and look at this, uh, I know exactly what this does. I can get a general overview of what our script does right at the top of the file. I don't have to scroll through uh, the lines and parse out the code. So it's really helpful for new people, especially you onboard someone new to your team. Um, this consistently documenting what each module does, what each function does, really helps people get on board faster and understand your code better. Uh, the other tags, the NetSuite tags are there. The required NetSuite, NetSuite tags are there. That's good. This contents tag I'm not familiar with. I'm not sure that that is a valid JS doc tag. Um, if you have some kind of JS doc plugin that's adding tags, that's great. Uh, what it looks like it's doing is uh, naming the module. Um, I use the exports tag for that. And just like with my file names, I have a module naming scheme. And so I start with the abbreviation of my company or the project once again. Um, then I give the module a name uh, or kind of the action of what we're doing here. And that's package creation. I use a spinal case for this, which uh, Think some people might call like URL case where I use hyphens to separate words and everything is lowercase. And then uh, I put the script type at the end too. So I know that right away, I know that this script is for the XXX company, uh, part of the package creation project, and it is a sweetlet. I know all that from the module name. I have some additional tags. Let's see, this is the same account. We'll just copy that over. Um, I have these additional optional tags. This is not my code, so I'll take that out. Now, if we do a quick scan of the actual code, um, we'll just get my reactions there. So as I just kind of scroll down the file, the very first thing I notice is that the entire file is one function. So all of the logic is contained inside this one on request function. So it's very procedural. Um, I prefer to break things up into smaller logical pieces and then recombine them to build something to build the larger system. I think that improves readability, uh, in my opinion. And it also makes it so we don't have to scroll through uh, hundreds of lines of code to understand what the module accomplishes. Uh, we can kind of look at the function names and we can look at the main request entry point and just get a very good idea there for, of what the function does in addition to um, our module description that we added. Um, what else do I see? The indentation is consistent for the most part. Down at the very end, we get a little bit of, uh, there's a few things out of place. Um, and that's fine. Um, so when you use an IDE, uh, like WebStorm, uh, Eclipse, any tools like that built for code, usually there is uh, some kind of code formatting. And so I can just go here to reformat code and that will automatically fix all my indentation among other things. Uh, so that's not a big deal, but uh, being consistent with uh, 
naming schemes like we've already seen, with indentation, with formatting code. Uh, consistency there is crucial. Um, you'll hear me talk about consistency a lot in this video. Um, that consistency makes for less cognitive load when you are reading the script, so you're not uh, just one less thing to think about when things are formatted and organized consistently. Uh, the code just gets that much easier to read and lets you use your brain, brain power <laughs> to focus on solving problems, not uh, translating code, essentially. Um, it also makes for easier onboarding, easier to understand for new people. Okay, um, as I looking here, especially what I can see is that there's some inconsistent naming or, or patterns in the variable names. So some of them are all lowercase, even though they're multiple words. Uh, some of them capitalize the second word. So some use camel case, some are all lowercase. Um, and so that, again, that comes back to the consistency. Uh, Think the more consistency, the more patterns you use in your code, um, the easier onboarding is going to be, the less cognitive load there's going to be, uh, because certain things you do all the time, like create variables, for instance, function names, file names, those types of things will just be automatic. Uh, they'll just become muscle memory, and as you're typing, they'll just flow naturally, and they'll be consistent uh, without ha you having to think about it too much. Uh, it also increases your productivity because of that. Uh, things f flow faster, so you'll work faster. Um, you'll get more done. And then that consistency flows into the ability for you to create templates and templatize things. So, um, you know, if you develop patterns for how you uh, write searches and how you process search results, for instance, one example, uh, you'll easily be able to use your IDE to templatize that type of thing, making you even more productive. Uh, so you don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code. You can focus on the critical elements of the application that you're building. Um, so that consistency lets you build, build and automate uh, your productivity that way. Um, Let's see, another nice advantage of an IDE like WebStorm is that I can very quickly see that we have unused variables. Um, and so that means we are unnecessarily taking up some memory in our script. Uh, we're also making, you know, we're adding more code. More code makes it harder to read. Um, and we have an unused, a completely unused dependency here. So we're, we're loading this module explicitly. Uh, but then not even using it. Uh, with the log module, that's a little bit uh, iffy because the log module gets loaded no matter what. But I can very easily see I have an unused dependency. Uh, I'm going to leave it there because I actually want to use the log module because that is another thing I notice. As I scroll through, there is no logging in this at all. Uh, that is a... Logging is a critical piece of troubleshooting. So if something were to go wrong in this script, I would really have no idea where to start because there would be no logs. All I would see in the logs would be an error. And NetSuite's errors are notoriously not helpful for getting you started. So the more logging you can add initially, um, the better you'll be able to troubleshoot later. Um, and logging is another one of those things where I have a pretty well-established pattern uh, that I use uh, and I'll employ as I rewrite this myself. Um, one of the things I saw down here, we already have consistent uh, and informative IDs for the fields on our custom record. Uh, so that's really good. A lot of times what I see here is like cust record 57, cust record 58. Um, that's extremely not helpful. But here, I can read this, I can see, oh, this is the piece count field on this custom record. I've never seen this custom record definition myself in the UI, but I know I can still tell what these fields are uh, just from the ID. So uh, making consistent and informative 
IDs for all of your custom objects, records, fields, searches, whatever it is. Um, it just makes uh, your life so much easier as a developer uh, because if this was cust record 57, I would never know what that meant. It would be really hard to retain that. Like, oh, was the package type 57 or 58? I can't remember. I have to go back to the UI. And it just crushes your productivity. Um, so having consistent informative IDs like this is a great, great practice, great habit to get into as an organization. Okay, so let's start. Uh, let's get back up to the top and just start going through and maybe rewriting this how, how I might go about it. Uh, let's see. So one thing I notice is that this, uh, so what we're doing is reading the parent ID out of a URL parameter. But I would never know from this parameter name, rec URL, I'm not sure I would ever know that this is the, the shipment parent. Uh, so that just seems like a, a strange parameter name. So I might change that. Um, so I'm just going to copy this. And I like to use camel case for my variables. So every word gets capitalized, but it starts with a lowercase letter. And I would probably have this, you know, just be parent ID or something like that rather than rec URL. Uh, but again, something informative uh, so that you can tell right away uh, what it is just by looking at it. Okay, the next thing I would do is move the form creation to a separate function. Uh, so I would add a private function that its only responsibility is to create the form. Okay, so then this function we will return needs to output the form that it creates. That's one thing we need to add. And also we need to And I mentioned the logging pattern that I follow. One of part of that pattern, I actually explain the pattern in detail in a separate video, which I will link right here. But uh, part of the pattern is that every time I enter a new function, I log an audit level message that just tells me, hey, here's where you are in the script. We still need to, the last thing we need to do in the, as part of the get request at least, is write the form to the response. We have this ship parent ID variable, but we're not using it. So let's go find that on this side. It's used as the default value here in the form creation. So we need to pass that in to our render form. Okay, we'll rename it as parent ID and we'll pass it in. Now in this case, I might add at least temporarily a debug statement that tells me what ship parent ID is. This to only happen on a get request. Okay, so already, if we just pause to look at this, uh, if I were to ask you, what does this sweetlet do on a get request? Which is a pretty common question you might ask yourself if you were maintaining this code or you inherited it uh, or uh, as you were writing it. Um, so 
what does this, if we look at the, the one on the left, what does this suitelet do on a get request? Okay, I look, I know that on request is the entry point. Uh, okay, here's the get request. First it creates a form, then it adds a whole bunch of fields. Uh, it has a submit button and then it writes the form to the page. Okay, so I had to scroll through 195 lines of code to definitively get that answer. Just of, of what does it do? I didn't necessarily ask how does it do it, just what does it do? But if we look at this suitelet here, I can fit all of this on one screen in 10 lines. And you can quickly see on a get request, okay, here's the entry point. Uh, here's where we detect it's a get request. Oh, it renders a form based on the ship parent ID and writes that form back to the page. I can get all that information from 10 lines of code rather than scrolling through 200 lines. Because I moved the functionality out to a function and gave it an informative name. Uh, so my code is much more concise. Uh, I haven't really shortened it. I probably have more lines now uh, in total, but if I don't care how the form is getting rendered, then I don't need to scroll through all of this and I can just skip over the render form function and move on. All right, the next thing I'm looking at in this are the IDs of the UI components. So first the field group IDs are fine. Uh, they at least tell me they are field groups, but it's gonna be hard to remember what's field group one, what's field group two, what's field group, th group three, when I scroll down 150 lines and I'm trying to add the length field, uh, which, first of all, looking at this, I have no idea what field group two is. I have to scroll all the way back up here. There's field group two. Okay, field group two is the dimensions. Great. Um, so I have to jump back and forth in my code just to remember what field group two is. Um, and then the UI fields, the custom fields that we're adding to the page, they have informative IDs, but they look like IDs for fields on a custom record. And that's not exactly what they are. Um, they, we use this data to then create uh, a custom record with the same field IDs. And so I, I, I understand the approach here, right? The, the ID of the field matches the, uh, on the form, matches the ID of the field uh, on the record. Um, so I do understand it from that approach, but it's also a little misleading. Uh, this looks like the ID of a custom record field. And so I typically will create my fields, any UI component will start with, instead of cust record like this, I start them with cust page. Um, and that clearly then indicates to me that this is a custom UI component, not a field for a record. Uh, and so I would expand that and I would add that same prefix to my field groups and make those IDs more informative. Okay, so I've made my field groups uh, a little more informative. Now, if I'm looking down here, I know exactly, okay, the weight field is getting added to the dimensions group, not cust, or uh, is it field group three or two? Uh, so I don't have to bounce back and forth to remember what they were. I know very clearly all three of these, four of these fields are going in the dimensions field group. Uh, and then let's update the rest go update the field IDs. So the, the latter half of the 
field IDs is still going to match the ID of its uh, corresponding field on the custom record. But now the prefix cust page clearly indicates to me that, okay, this is the UI field. And then down when we add the data creation, that will be clearly distinguished from the ID of the field on the record. Okay, now one thing, and this is not some context we can get from just looking at the code necessarily, uh, but some context that the person who submitted this code shared is that these select fields uh, are actually custom lists. And so we are, we're basically manually adding options for the for a custom list that exists in the UI as well. And there is a much better approach for handling that. So as it is right now, if, if this list uh, ever changes in the UI, so if we add another type of, this looks like maybe a package type. Oh, yep, package type. <laughs> um, if we ever add new package types, I don't know, envelope maybe, for instance, um, palette, uh, who knows? Um, if we ever add new ones in the UI, somebody is gonna have to know that, oh, we need to go back and add that to the code as well. Um, and if you do this in multiple places, maybe multiple different script types, that's gonna get really untenable and hard to maintain very quickly, especially if it's not a developer who is adding these options in the UI, which is entirely possible and common actually. So how can we make that a little more maintainable? Um, when you create a select field, NetSuite actually has a nice mechanism for that. So let's go look at the help for the field. So we look at the add field method for the form. One of the things we want to look at is this source parameter. And we can use the source parameter to map our select fields, our list record fields, to, a, to an, an existing list. So if all we want to populate our dropdown with is the values for an existing custom list, like we're doing here, then instead of doing all of these select option calls, we just need to add the source parameter to our add field call. And we pass there the ID of the custom list or custom record that we're sourcing from. Uh, now I don't have the exact custom list ID of this, but it would probably look something like, <clears throat> like this. Based on the, the naming scheme used elsewhere on other IDs, I'm gonna guess that that is at least close to the ID of the custom list. But that's all we have to do. Uh, we shouldn't need to add any select options ourselves. In fact, when you specify the source parameter, you can't add options yourself. NetSuite will source from the list with this ID and that will be the options. You can't add more or remove them yourself. And we're doing that elsewhere on the number line. And so instead of this, I don't know, 30 lines of code or so, we can get rid of all of that and just replace it with the source. I'm not sure again, but We'll just pretend that's the ID. Now NetSuite will automatically source all the values for this uh, select field from this custom list. The other thing we can do is get rid of all these unused variables. Uh, they don't need to be there, dicking up uh, memory and brain space as we read the code. Okay, uh, the last thing I do is just add some visual separation between uh, different groups of logic. So just add some blank lines where we're adding all the field groups. Here we are 
these are all with the head this head field the parent field and the submit button and sometimes just a little bit of visual separation also helps our brain uh, read this a little easier and, and group things that are related. We could consider everywhere we added visual space, we could consider even isolating that in its own function. I don't think that's necessary here, uh, but we could, for instance, have a function that adds all the field groups, then a function that only adds all the fields. Um, that's a little bit unnecessary here. I don't think it adds enough value to do that. Okay, so now let's go to the processing of the post event. And the first thing I would do is I would explicitly handle the post. So as it was before here, it's just an else. So if the request is not a git, um, we're going to try to create a record. Well, what if somebody sends a delete request or a put request? Those aren't necessarily uh, going to work. Uh, they'll, they'll try to trigger the same uh, action, but none of this data will, will be present. Um, so what I would actually do is explicitly handle the post, put my functionality in there, and then add a default case. where you've basically sent me a request that I don't support. So I need to throw an error because I don't know what to do with that. You can use, there is an error module that you can use to create proper NetSuite errors. In this case, I'm just gonna throw an object with a couple of properties. Okay, so if you send me a get, we'll do this. If you send me a post, we will do this part. So first, I'm just going to copy over all of this. So what do we do in the post? We read data out of the parameters. Then we use that data to create and save an instance of a custom record. And then we write a simple text back to the user. So the first thing I want to do, again, I like to break functionality down into small single purpose functions. And so I'm going to break this up into reading the data, creating the record, and writing the response. And I'm going to create functions for those. Um, so I'm going to collapse the render form function and add a function for first reading the data out of the context. Uh, and here that I look at it, I want another level of logging to, to tell me that I'm getting to the right uh, spot in my script so let's add more audit logging all right i haven't quite finished our read data function here i prefer to work with objects when i'm reading a lot of data like this i prefer to work with a single object rather than uh, 10 variables, if I'm counting right, 10, 11, 12, whatever. So instead of reading each of these values into a separate variable, I'm going to read them all into a single object, which will be the output of my function. So actually what we can do Let's 
just remove all the vars. Replace the equals with colons. And replace the semicolons with commas. Just in our selection, obviously. Fix our indentation. Okay, and then we have to remember that the parameter names will match the, oops, I minimized it, will match the field IDs that we added. And remember, in our field IDs, we replaced cust record with cust page. Let's minimize this again. And now we are reading all of the data. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was fix the case. Again, I use, I prefer to use camel case. All right, and there we have our read data function. It should be ready to go. The next thing I have my data, uh, I want to replace the record creation. And I want to put that in its own function. And of course, function names, variable names are entirely up to you. Uh, I'm going to call this data to record. It will take data as input. And based on the function name, you can assume that, OK, this function is going to take some data and turn it into a record, which is exactly what it does. Okay, one thing I forgot in my read data function was my audit statement. Again, that consistency. Okay, now this is unused, so let's, let's actually use it. We'll just log out the ID that gets created. And we will return that as well. Uh, we don't need, a, need it in this particular instance, but you may want to return as output the ID of the record you just created. And now we need to put this to use. So back in our post handling, we read the data, then we need to turn that data into a record. Now we don't even really need this data variable. We can actually just take this, cut it. Now here's a way we could leverage the ID that we returned. The next thing I see is the magic strings here, uh, or the get and the post. Um, it's not, there's nothing seriously wrong with that. Um, but oftentimes comparing to magic strings like this, or numbers or, or just raw values, is a little bit dangerous in case it ever changes. In this case, it's pretty low risk. I doubt the HTTP spec is gonna change the name of these operations. Uh, so you're pretty safe there. But wherever possible, I prefer to use um, programmatic values instead of hard-coded magic strings. Um, and so the HTTP module, which is what where this request object comes from, actually has an enumeration of the request types. We go look at the help for the HTTP module quickly. 
you can see it has this method enumeration, which enumerates the four supported HTTP request types. And so we're gonna use that. I'm gonna import the HTTP module and use this enumeration to check uh, my values. So something like this, let's say NetSuite uh, grew a wild hair to change these to lowercase. Um, you would have no way of knowing that. That's not something they would ever publish in release notes or anything like that. And all of a sudden your script would break and you would have no idea. Um, the place they would change that is in their, you know, their implementation of this enumeration. And so if we use this enumeration, we've now insulated ourselves. Um, as long as NetSuite keeps this API consistent, they can change it as much as they want and our script will continue to work just fine. Right, so we need to add the HTTP module. So we have our HTTP module imported as HTTP. Now I can use that method enumeration rather than the magic string. Now I'm sure some people might argue with me that I just added a whole new dependency just to import this module. Was that really worth it? Uh, in my mind, yes, it was. I prefer uh, to isolate logic in a single place in a separate module, and I have no problem importing more dependencies um, if it means I have more stable code. But you could argue the other way and keep it magic strings, and as long as it works, there's not much I can say. <laughs> So if we just look at the entry the, and compare the two different entry points now, and again, if I ask you the same question, what does the suitelet do? Um, if we go look on the left, we can we have to scroll through all you know, 250 lines to answer the question, what does it do? But on the right, I can even collapse this here. Uh, I can see that just by looking at the entry point and you ask me, what does this suitelet do? I can one, read the comment we added, the module header that we added. But more importantly, it's very easy for documentation to get out of date if you're not uh, diligent, disciplined in your updating. But more importantly, I can look at the code and just read through that. And I can say, oh, on, well, my entry point is on request, and the on request function uh, looks like it grabs some data out of the from the URL. On when it receives a get request, it renders a form based on that URL parameter and writes that form to the page. And when it receives a post request, it reads data out of the context, turns that data into a record, and writes the ID of that record back to the response. And if it receives uh, some other request type, it throws an error. And so I can look at all of that. I don't have to scroll anywhere. Um, it's in so 20 lines of code, 25 lines of code. Uh, I don't have to scroll anywhere, and I can read all that information right here. That is what breaking logic down into smaller uh, single purpose functions does. That's what it allows you to do. You can drastically increase the readability and the um, conciseness of your code. Uh, because I wasn't asking how does it do that. And if I did ask, like, oh, okay, well, how does it render the form? Well, then I know, okay, I can just go into that function. And then I can read from there how that, okay, here's how it renders the form. It uses native UI components. Um, and I could list off all the fields that it adds. But by abstracting that away, if I don't need to know how it renders the form, I can just skip over that and I can ignore 
what's inside the render form function and go focus on the code that's important. Whereas on this side, I would have to kind of scroll through and scroll pa all the way past it just to find like, okay, the functionality I actually care about is down here somewhere. I guess technically I did not finish implementing our data to record. This will not be correct. Now here's another nice advantage of using uh, a good IDE like this. Oops. So I start typing, it recognizes that I have a piece count property up above. I can use autocomplete that way. Okay, now one thing I really um, like to avoid in my own code is large. That won't work. There we go. Uh, large if else uh, blocks or um, switch statements. Alternatively, I just prefer not to have those. So I want to show a pattern that I normally follow instead. So what I want to do is every um, case here, I guess, in our in our if block, our if else block, I want to have its own function, a single entry point function. So when I have a get request, that will call a single function. And when I have a post request, that will call a single function. And anything else, that will call a single function. So I'm going to add those three functions now. The three new functions, handle get, handle post, handle error. And they'll all get, they will all get the same context, the context value here. They will all get that passed to them. And so first I want to take everything we do in the get request, put that in the handle get function. And I'm actually gonna move this ship parent ID. We don't need that in the post request, so there's no reason for it to be out here in the global. You know, we don't need to do this every time. We only care about the ship parent ID on a get request. And I should put that below my logging statement. Okay. Now, instead of having these large, and this, this isn't that large, of course, but um, you can quickly see how, in a lot of cases, we do have a, a lot of different conditions that we handle. One example that comes to mind is like a, a field changed handler in a client script. Oftentimes, I just see massive if else and switch blocks in those. Um, and so instead of just if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, here's a pattern that I follow. So first what I've done is I have created this event map object. And what it does is it maps. So our conditions here are we are routing our logic based on the method of the request. And so what I'm doing here is adding a property for every possible condition that we handle. And so each property in this event map will map uh, the HTTP method, the event or the request method, to the function that handles that method. Um, so that's why we made separate functions for these. And so the value we are switching on is the context.request.method. So what we want to do is the 
the method on the actual request is present in our event map, then we will invoke that function, passing it the context of the script. And if it's not present, then we call our error handler. And that will get rid of our entire need for the if else structure. So all we do is we make a separate entry point function for each uh, possible condition, each route that our script could take. We map that function to the, the condition. And we set that up in an object. So this that kind of acts as an event router. Then we check. This basically checks our conditions. It goes to the right uh, route within our map and invokes that function. And if we don't have a route defined, we call our default processing, which in this case uh, is our error thrower. Now, one more change that I might make to this. And it depends largely on the utilization of this custom record, which is just context that I don't have. Uh, in this case, I'm not sure. But perhaps there are many other entry points for creating this type of record. So maybe we have this one sweetlet that tries to create it. Uh, maybe there are Maybe we want to create these, perhaps, uh, since they're shipments, perhaps we want to create them as item fulfillments are created. So from a user event script, um, maybe there is some kind of bulk process or uh, an integration that we have that might be sending us package information. And so we'd want to create these from a RESTlet as well. What I don't want to do is take this function and copy and paste it into every single entry point that we might ever add. I want the logic for creating one of these shipment line records to live in one, one place uh, so that I can update it, modify it, maintain it in one place, not seven. Um, so if, if it were the case that in our account in our business logic we were creating this shipment line record from multiple different entry points i would take this logic right here and i would rip it out and move it into its own custom module so that is what i'm going to do right now i'm going to cut this i'm going to make a brand new empty module and follow our naming scheme. Now with custom modules, I don't have, it's, it's not a script entry point, so I don't need to define it as a sweetlet or a client script. Uh, it doesn't have a script type. It's just its own module. So we'll skip that part of the naming scheme. And this is, let's see, package creation. In this case, we're creating, I might expand this module later to do other things like edit them, uh, read them, translate them into different formats. Uh, there might be, a, there might be a, a lot of other logic centered around the, um, this package module or record. And I might include all of those in this module. So this is really the business logic of our package record. And so what this allows me to do is define one single API for how packages are created. So I can define one specific format. Here are the inputs you need to provide in order to create a package record. I might actually just call this create. I 
don't need to change anything else. Um, that the logic is so is is nicely isolated. It's not dependent on anything external. We just need to create the appropriate uh, data object to pass in. And that is all. We have no other dependencies. And I need to add export our create method. And one thing I want to do, because this is going to be a commonly reused module, I want to document the format of the input and output appropriately. And I won't go through them all this way, but by explicitly enumerating the different parameters like this, we can easily tell other developers uh, the API for this function. Uh, so we can give them the property name of the object, what type it is, and where it gets, where it will eventually end up on the record. So you would do that for each of these uh, fields you're setting. And then we'll add a little description. So this returns the internal ID of the shipment that gets created. Uh, one other thing I like to document on functions like this is how much governance they use. So this creates an instance of a custom record, which uses two units. Set value doesn't use any. And then save will use four. So this uses a total of six units every time it gets called. All right. Now in this case, so now we just need to replace uh, where we were calling our data to record function, we now need to import our shipment module and use its create function. So okay, so we will import that module as shipment. And then down where we have data to record, that is now shipment.create. And so it's still very easy to tell um, what this does. So on a post request, we read some data out of the context, then we create a shipment record based on that data and write the package ID back to UI. But we have isolated this creation logic into its own reusable module. And so now when we do in the future integrate um, maybe another uh, supplier or um, you know, e-commerce front end, depending on how it handles shipments, we have we can re we can just reuse this exact same logic by importing this module into whatever new script type whether it's a restlet or a user event uh, MapReduce doesn't matter we now have one common place where we maintain the logic for creating these shipment line records and so if this if we ever expand the data that gets collected by these records. Um, Again, we have one place to change that rather than multiple. Okay, were this a teardown for one of my clients? I believe these are the recommendations I would have made. So just to wrap this up, what did we accomplish here? Um, and we didn't make any real optimizations. Um, the logic here is straightforward enough and there's just not enough complexity to warrant, you know, performance or optimization improvements. Uh, we're only using six governance units in the creation of our custom record. And so six is well below our limit in a suitelet of 1000. There's plenty of room to grow before we have to worry about governance limits. And other than that, we are, we're using uh, native UI components. There's not really any optimizations we can make to form creation. Um, you know, maybe we're just making a single plain old JavaScript object here. So not really any optimizations to make there. Uh, overall, the performance of this is just, it's not a concern. Um, there's not much we can do to improve on it. We're mostly using native uh, SweetScript methods. 
So what did we accomplish then? Um, most of the changes we made were in refactoring the logic down into smaller combinable functions rather than having one monolithic function to scan through. And if we look, so our original suitelet had 259 lines. Our new suitelet only has 188. So the suitelet itself is shorter, but to be fair, we did add a new module, which has 77 lines. So we're somewhere over 260 lines total. So we actually increased the number of lines, but uh, in my opinion, we actually improved the readability and the we reduced the cognitive load of learning and maintaining this script. Because normally, you know, or in the original, every time we have to make a change in this, we have to scroll through single function or troubleshoot this. We have to scroll through. Uh, there's no help in where do we go to either make a change or a fix? By breaking out into smaller functions and following patterns like uh, adding a log message in each of those functions, we get much more traceability, much more troubleshooting capabilities, uh, or much more efficient troubleshooting, essentially. Um, and it becomes a lot easier to read. So if I'm coming in here to maintain this, and I know that, oh, we want to add a field to the form. Uh, I can basically you know, click here. Here's where we render the form. My IDE lets me hit F3 to jump straight to that function. Um, and now I can, I can focus just on this, uh, I don't know, 100 line block of code here. Uh, I can focus within this single function and make my changes there um, without a lot of searching. And then, or alternatively, may, maybe I know like, oh, we're not reading the right data for the length for some reason. Check on that. Um, even if mentally, or sorry, even if my, I don't have an IDE that allows me to collapse code like uh, WebStorm does here, I can do that by breaking it out into functions. I can do that mentally. I can kind of ignore. I know the problem is in read data, so I can mentally ignore everything else around it and just focus straight in on the read data function. Like, okay, there's a problem with the length. Oh, I see if there's a typo in the property name, for instance. Um, so if you're not doing that, you kind of have to scan through and find, eventually find the length. Um, there's nothing to kind of collapse around you. Um, so it takes longer to find and orient yourself in the code. And also our, our um, by breaking it into smaller functions, you're giving specific uh, parts of your business logic, you're giving them a name like handle post or render form. And so it's much easier mentally to kind of parse what does this do? Um, so I can come in and look at the handle get and I could say, what do we do? Well, we render a form and then write it to the page. <laughs> and you can read plain English to figure that out rather than deciphering code to figure that out and scrolling through hundreds of lines. I can get all that information from one line of code. And that is it for this teardown. Uh, if you or your team could use a similar teardown of your own sweet script, uh, make sure you check out the link displayed here on the screen and also included down in the description. If you liked what you saw in this video, hit that thumbs up button. Go share what you learned with someone else. Uh, click subscribe to keep up with all my videos and become a competent, confident SweetScript developer yourself. Thanks for watching. Keep learning, keep sharing, and I'll see you next time.